So what? Context to that question. Like, there's a whole lot of line of thought that goes before that. No. Yeah, I mean, okay, but no. Maybe we can just talk a little bit about that. That in, in the wisdom's case, at least, uh, context is not really necessary. <sighs> because it doesn't belong to space and time. If you look over human history, uh, the first written piece that we have is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's about, oh, I don't know, given that we have been oral cultures for the longest time, I have no doubt that the story were on people's tongue for a long time, and then written language or words were created in Egypt in the form of cuneiform about 5,000 years ago, and it became more and more complicated to the time the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, and the story, <coughs> you know, kept getting longer and longer. And if you go back maybe five, six, seven, ten thousand to the Epic of Gilgamesh, you realize Gilgamesh really was alone. And very much like his question, he became very passionate about certain things of himself, about life, about love, about the companion. No, maybe he was, maybe I missed that, but he could have been. He was a giant thinker, I suppose. Um, and he was an empath of sorts. I mean, I think whenever you have wisdom inside you, you also are able to see through people. You're also able to see their flaws, their shortcomings, and you would want to help them. They don't need to come out and tell you that they need help. You just can see by their body language, by especially their facial expressions. <clears throat> and you realize ultimately that no one really is able to receive wisdom or advice well. And so the person with a good amount of wisdom always lives alone and leaves in frustration because you can't. Uh, give anything away, you know. So, let's talk about failures. Let's talk about failures and their power to create a unique self-image. Let's talk about happiness that brings about fulfillment and then time steals it and we are plunged into spiritual, intellectual, psychological, emotional poverty. <sighs> yeah. It's a very different question. Sure. How much agency do we have over what we want to do? Nothing. You have agency over nothing. I don't know much about reincarnation. Um, I don't know why infants cry if they have dreams, if they have memories of a past life. Uh, those things are not important for me. All I perhaps can say is all of us come into this life like a blank floppy disk or a flash drive. All of us are blank. You have good parents, they're relatively healthy, and your definition of relationship is going to be somewhat healthy. That's going to be kind of burned on your flash drive. If on the other hand, your parents are abusive or they shout and scream every, every single day, then that's going to be your definition of a relationship, of what a parent is, what a mother is. And then you go throughout life, you know, you have someone like Carlton who lives in Bel Air, who lives in a gated community, doesn't know much about racism. So the idea of concept of racism for the most part is absent from a psychology. But then he gets exposed. All of a sudden you have an extra piece of information. So, uh, and what happens is depending on your experiences, what gives you pleasure, what gives you pain, you move through life very much like 
a robot trying to figure out which path you should go or you should take that will bring about the least amount of harm and the most amount of benefit. Have you ever had korma sabzi? Go home and eat some. And the idea of you saying, well, I have free will, well, no, you don't have free will. You have never seen korma sabzi. You have never eaten korma sabzi. You don't even know what it is. So for me to tell you, once you go home and, you know, eat some, it's ridiculous. You can't will yourself to eat it unless you first get your psyche exposed to it. Go to YouTube and just type in the search engine, korma sabzi. Well, yeah. The point is you can only pursue the things you've been exposed to, you know. All right. <sighs> can I tell you a story first? I borrow the story... <coughs> from one of my good friends who is long dead. He died of cancer some years ago, maybe five, six, seven decades ago. He lived in India. His name is Sri Ramana Maharshi. Never met him in person. I wasn't even born. At the age of 12, this tiny little young brown kid in India, I just come home from school and he had this feeling as if he was going to die at the age of 12. At first he was extremely frightened, then he says to himself, if I'm going to die, maybe I should just experience how the process is. So instead of running away or going to his brother or his mother or screaming or shouting, he simply very calmly just lays on the kitchen floor. He says, if I'm going to die, I'm going to pay attention to how this is going to unfold. So as he lays on the kitchen floor, remember this is a 12-year-old kid, all of a sudden he feels as if there is this part of him that leaves his physical body. You want to call the soul, you can. You want to call the mind, you can. I don't really know what words one should use for our generation since we don't really believe in anything or we believe in everything, but they don't really mean anything. So for the sake of our argument, let's just say his soul leaves his physical body and finds itself near the ceiling. He looks down and says, wait a minute. This does not make any sense. I'm about to die, and yet something about me is untouched by death. It seems that death only touches my physical body, but not my soul, not my spirit. And then after a few seconds, he drops back into his body, but he drops back with the memory, with the knowledge that he had this profound life-changing experience. That he's not just his body. And you don't have to be very profound to have those experiences. Imagine that you're driving to Pete's Coffee. You haven't run a red light. You're not going above the speed limit. Everything about your driving is fine. But you get pulled over. Maybe it's a white cop who doesn't like colored people, maybe it's a black cop, cop who doesn't like colored people, it doesn't really matter, but you get pulled over for no good reason. And then you're taken out and you say, officer, what did I do? License, registration, you give everything, but he's still not satisfied. And like all the horrifying stories and images we have seen the past maybe decade or so, going back to Rodney King perhaps, he starts beating you up and then after the whole episode is finished, you stand up and you say, justice, fairness, power. 
Why is it that whenever human beings have power, they begin to abuse other human beings? You're no longer really talking about being black or white or brown or yellow. You're talking about a relationship with a bigger concept, power. Why is it that power contaminates human beings? Why is it that power allows human beings or makes human beings abusive? That's a religious experience. Because the entire day you were thinking about how to make money, how to buy a car, how to please your parents, how to get an A. These are good desires, but they're profoundly small desires to have as human beings. All of a sudden, you're connected to an idea that's been around for five, six, ten thousand years. And you're only 12 or 13 or 15 or 16, and you want to know what power is and how it contaminates human beings. That is a religious experience, you see. At any event, this 12-year-old kid is dropped back into his body and he says to himself, why do I go to school and fill my mind with trash, algebra, philosophy, geography, food, money, power. There are two parts to me, he said. There is my body that has certain needs, but there is also my soul. And he said, I'd rather be my soul than my body. Consider that for a moment. Most of you in this class who have had traumas inside you, who have had pain inside you, it really has to do with your physical body. You're an infant, you want your mother to hold you, to love you. She doesn't come by, you want your father to take you to Target, to in and out he doesn't come by and you feel hurt. And you carry that hurt for the rest of your life. You're born, you happen to look like me, a man from the Middle East. So every time I want to travel outside of the country, I'm taken into a small room at the airport. And all of my holes are checked. Sometimes I enjoy them. <laughs> Sometimes. Depending who's doing the checking. Um, <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Like all of us in this class, Ramana Maharshi was no different. At a very young age, if you've seen the movie The Matrix, the experience offered him a red pill, but his life experience offered him a blue pill. The red pill is always difficult. You have to make sacrifices, you have to be trained. It's like being baptized through fire. The blue pill is, have the emotions you're comfortable with. Dislike the people you dislike, hate the people you hate, like the people you like. <clears throat> never self-reflect, never self-examine. Be fine with the pathetic little man or woman that you are. Ramana Mar, she ultimately says, I'd rather live through my soul than through my body. My body is lived in society, other people have power over it. My body lives in space and time, it gets old, it gets sick, it dies. My body has to fear not having money, not to have food, not to have love. My soul, on the other hand, is complete, is perfect. There is nothing it needs to do except to sit. And I don't want my soul to ever be disrupted by the desires of my flesh. So for those of you who have a good amount of anger inside you, there are two things you can do. You can either approach anger with wisdom or you can approach anger without wisdom. If you approach anger through wisdom, there is a calmness, a certain sense of understanding. You understand the history. You understand the emotions. And hopefully by the time you get wisdom, you also will be very eloquent in the way you express yourself through words to other people. Ramana Maharshi walks to his brother's room, steals 12 rupees, gets on a train, and goes to a town, Aranarchula. It's known to be a place for monks, lots of monasteries. Any of you ever been to India? It's a good place, used to be, not anymore. 
I lived in a place called Mesur. It was like a jungle, and right in the middle of the jungle, they had cut the trees and made the city. You walk around, you would see snakes, cows, cats, dogs, of course. You couldn't eat them. Uh, monkeys, gorillas, all sorts of exotic little animals. And you would see lots of monasteries, lots of temples, lots of monks. At any rate, he gets to this town, finds this monastery, goes to the basement and just sits. For days he just sits, doesn't move. And when they find him, they realize that all these cockroaches, these insects had bitten his legs. He was all bloodied up, but he experienced no pain. And that's one of the things about seeking wisdom as opposed to knowledge. Wisdom has to do with your soul. You don't much care about your physical life. <clears throat> so uh, they realize there is something quite majestic about this young man. And so they build a temple for him. And they ask him all sorts of questions. But he doesn't respond to any questions. He says that anyone who desires wisdom needs to go on this quest. For some people it takes five years. For some people it takes 55 years. For some people it takes five lifetimes or 55 lifetimes. No one knows when the gates will open and the wisdom will be given to anyone. If you're lucky, you'll become wise. If you're not, you can just be a student of wisdom without ever getting there. So this is his story. There was a stone cutter. You guys know what stone cutter is? It's a guy like your father who wakes up at six in the morning, goes into the world with his chisel, chisel and hammer and tries to make dealings with the world, with his boss, with other people to make some buck, to come home with some bread, some lettuce, some tomatoes and to give us ungrateful kids some food to eat. You know, you climb this mountain with a tiny little chisel and tiny little hammer, and you just have to kind of break this mountain into tiny little pieces and then take what you can to the market and sell them, sell the stones. That's a tough job. All of you in this class... You've been going to school, oh, God knows, for what, 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, some of you. You've had jobs. You work really, really hard to keep yourself from starving, making sure you don't lose your home, making sure that the people who have power over you will continue to like you, to give you money. You're no different than the stone cutter. All of us have to work really, really hard to keep what little we have. But here's the thing. As the stone cutter is walking to this mountain to chisel away or break some stone to sell, he comes across this man on a horse. He's seated on this horse, on this leather seat, and everybody bows to him says hello to him, and you have the first pathetic emotion that all of us in this class have. Envy, jealousy. You begin to have a good amount of resentment. You begin to think about injustice, inequality. I am made from the same material as this guy uh, seated on the horse. Why is it that he has everything and I nothing? Why is it that everybody says hello to him, but they only spit on me? Why is it he doesn't have to work, and yet he has all this money? I have to work. I have so little.
Some of you feel or perhaps know that you were born in the wrong body and you have all these conflicting emotions. You look at another and say, why can't I be like them, free of all these negative emotions? Empaths have a tendency of feeling and then thinking and then having all these conflicting emotions inside them. Sometimes they walk around town, look at another human being, and they're oblivious to everything. They laugh, they're merry, they're happy, they're joyous, and the empath says, why is it that I have to carry this burden? I don't want to feel the way I feel. I don't want to be the way I feel. Some people are born having good parents, and some people are born having crummy parents. And then you say, when you go to school, you know, and you wait for your parents to come, but they don't show up, but your friend's parents are always on time. You say, why did God give me such crummy parents? Resentment, anger, jealousy. All of us have it. We are contaminated by these emotions. We have no choice. Our good friend is in high school, sees his best friend gets piercings. The right ear, then the left ear, then the nose, then the chest, then the butt cheeks. Who the hell knows what piercings people get today? But he says, my friend gets all this attention. They go to him and they say, oh, that piercing, it looks cool. I want to be cool. So you go to some tattoo shop and you say, torture me. Can you drill a hole in my nose or ears or this or that? I want to be cool. Jealousy, resentment. We're all victims. All of us are. But here's the thing you need to know. Life makes all of us victims. There are no winners. Donald Trump has all this money, yet he is a victim of greed. He wants to be like Obama. He wants to be like George Bush. The next time you pick up the Bible and you want to figure out why your life is a mess and you specifically read the book of Job because you want to know why there is pain, why there is injustice, why you have to suffer so much even though you've never transgressed? You've never done anything wrong to anyone? You know what you're doing, right? You want the knowledge of good and evil inside you. You want wisdom inside you. You resent God for knowing everything. You want to be like God. You want to know everything. And you're angry because you don't know everything. And not knowing creates chaos. Chaos disturbs you physically, emotionally, intellectually, psychologically. So the stone cutter looks at this man on this horse and says, I want power. He closes his eyes and prays to Brahman. When you go to a therapist and you talk to your therapist about your dilemma, what are you hoping for? An answer. Not having an answer means you're poor. Nobody enjoys being poor. You're pushed around by poverty. If on the other hand you have answers, you are rich. And when you are rich, you will push the chaos around, not chaos pushing you around. You will be creative with chaos. You'll go into your room and you write poetry. You'll play music. Now, there is something very strange about the stone cutter is that the gods really, really like him. And so when he prays and says, I, want to, I no longer want to be a stone cutter, 
but I want to be this man seated on this horse, the God say, okay. All of a sudden, he wakes up, and here's this man seated on this horse. Oh, man, and he feels good. You know, when you look in your pocket and you got zero dollars, you feel bad. And then someone pays, gives you a check, you know, a thousand bucks, oh, it makes you feel good. Poverty never makes you feel good unless you chose poverty. And whenever you choose poverty, it means you look the other way when you're rich. You will give your riches away and you will choose poverty. And you will only do that when you come to realize that, yes, you have money, but money doesn't bring you the things you want. You know, uh, there is this actor, Ben Stiller, is it? He had a rough relationship with his daughter. And only recently have they began to create a relatively warm and father-daughter relationship. And he came to this conclusion that kids don't really care how powerful you are, how important you are, how famous you are. They just want to make sure that when they come home, you're there. You hold them. You shouldn't watch TV with them. They don't really care if you've made five million movies out there. They just want to be around you. <clears throat> the tragedy that now is upon this stonecutter, who is no longer a stonecutter, but a man seated on a horse, is that the horse is walking in Texas. Summertime, temperature, 958. Have any of you ever been seated on a leather seat in a warm, hot temperature? It's like an oven, oven times two. Power all of a sudden does something to him. You know, if you're a stone cutter, you can just go with your tank top and your shorts on top of a mountain, start breaking the mountain to pieces. You'll be hot, but you'll not be as hot. If on the other hand, you're wearing a jacket, a turtleneck, pants, you know, robe, on a horse, leather seat, it's misery. And so this man seated on this horse looks around and sees all these other people just walking and being happy. But he wants to understand the source of his misery. He looks up and he comes to realize that there is the sun scorching down upon him. And he says, I thought I was the most powerful man on this planet. Alas, I've come to realize there is something more powerful than I am. It's the sun. This whole episode starts again. Anger, jealousy, resentment. I want to be as powerful as the sun. This man does not know how to deal with pain. This man doesn't know what to do with dissatisfaction. He is greedy. He wants power. He wants to be comfortable all the time. And he is filled with envy. The gods like him. He's put to sleep like Adam in Genesis. He wakes up and all of a sudden he is the sun. Oh man, he's having a good time. He turns night into day, turns day into night. He makes people's lives a mess. One day this stone cutter, but now the sun wakes up and says, today I'm going to make people's lives a living hell. I'm going to make it so hot. And in Oakland, where people don't usually have air conditioning, at least they didn't used to, right? They still don't, yeah. And so he wakes up with this hope, but he comes to realize that despite all of his power, he can generate heat that comes down to earth. And he wants to know why he looks out, there is this tiny little black cloud that's standing in its way, 
He says, oh my God, more powerful than the sun is this tiny little black cloud. Again, envious of this cloud. He prays, I want to be this cloud. And he becomes the cloud. 